In a few moments, if I would say a few words about some evolving um, thinking, I asked the panelists, you know, to throw out, so throw out some ideas, frameworks of thinking, um, as opposed to the more detailed empirical type papers expected from regular panelists in a plenary session. And I proceed precisely to do that. Um, I want to address very briefly some issues and challenges relating to the African Caribbean relationship within the context of third worldism on the one hand and as was not said in the title pan-africanism on the other i begin by looking on third worldism and pan-africanism as two very important organizing frameworks both for anal analyzing the history and development of relationships between the two regions and also in terms of understanding certain dynamics of those relationships of course, the points of departure of the two differ slightly, even though they ultimately converge in certain areas. To analyze the third world connection is essentially to look on political economic relationships, whereas to analyze the Pan-African relationship is to look essentially on political racial and to some extent political cultural relationships. To look at the third world connection is to look essentially at government to government, relationships, whether these are pursued through institutions like the Non-Aligned Movement or the ACP or the Group of 77 or Lome and so on forth and so forth, whereas the Pan-African relationship essentially is a people-to-people -people relationships, even though governments have piggybacked on it, um, so to speak, in recent times. Um, the third world relationship between the two regions is essentially, necessarily, a phenomenon of the post-colonial period the post-1950s, the 60s, maturing essentially in the 1970s. The Pan-African relationship is far more historical. In fact, implicitly beginning with transatlantic slavery and being expressed through various strivings for identity and commonality between the continent and the African diaspora, even prior to 1900, when the phrase Pan-Africanism was first formally introduced into the international political vocabulary with the convening of the first Pan-African Conference in London by a Trinidadian, Henry Sylvester Williams, um, and other people at W.B. Du Bois of the United States being then prominent actors all through the Garvey movement of the early part of the century and even um, in the pre-20th century. Now, having said that, of course, what we recognize in looking both at third world and Pan-African frameworks is that the Caribbean and Africa have a combined saliency, shall we say, within the two movements. If one looks at the history of the third world development, essentially starting from an Afro-Asian base and spreading out in the 1950s, the Bandung Conference and beyond, there's no question in my mind that Africa has been the single most significant catalyst toward the third world movement, whether in terms of the contribution of the number of state actors, whether in terms of the very important role that Africans played in organizing and consolidating the non-aligned movement, or even in terms of the type of predicaments posed by Africa's continuing economic challenges within the framework of third worldism. So if Africa then was an essential catalyst toward the third world movement um, in recent times, the Caribbean, on the other hand, has remained a very important third world symbol, as captured in uh, Naipaul's view of the Caribbean as the third world's third world. Or if you look at it another way, in terms of the continuing challenges that the Caribbean poses to the United States as the closest third world neighbor of a resurgent and arrogant Western imperial, quote unquote, leader. Within the framework of Pan-Africanism, again, there is no question that the African continent is the primary center of gravity. Ultimately, Pan-African aspirations have focused on the African continent, even though many of them have involved Africans dispersed abroad. And the consolidation and fortunately now erosion of apartheid on the African continent itself has remained as one of the most important Pan-African challenges of recent times. The Caribbean, on the other hand, we must not forget, has historically made very important contributions to the concept and organization of Pan-Africanism. Negritude, 
as a principle developed in the Caribbean. Many major Pan-African Pan actors, and I won't bother mentioning them, Garvey, Padmore, C.L.R. James, um, Fanon, Walter Rodney, just to mention a few, <laughs> and so forth. Just to mention a few. And the positioning of the Caribbean, as I've argued, in between the slave experience of the Americas and the colonial experience of Africa has been a very important factor in that regard. Now, having said this, I think it's important to, in understanding the way in which Pan-Africanism historically has nurtured notions of third worldism, and conversely, how the third world movement has been energized by Pan-Africanism. Here again, we have no time to go into the historical record, but all I want to point out is this, that some time ago, Nirera of Tanzania, at the Sixth Pan-African Conference, posed a challenge. Pan-Africanism, he said, would do a great disservice to the third world if it meant the exclusion or removal of Africans and Caribbeans from the wider movement. A very interesting thought, a very appropriate warning, but in fact, one, if you look on the history, not really justified. Because if you look at the history of Pan-Africanism, at least from 1900, there's always been an attempt to link the identity of Africans worldwide with the oppressed peoples beyond Africa. It's very, very clear, as in 1900, when Du Bois, writing his address to the world, pointed out a challenge which is still relevant in 1992, that the future of the world will in all possibility may be what the peoples of Africa, Asia, Latin America, the islands of the sea, make it if only because of their sheer numbers. When Marcus Garvey, 1921, addressed the conference on disarmament by telegram, he was invited, obviously, and made the point that peace not founded on human justice is a mockery. That too was another statement linking a Pan-African sentiment and sensitivity to a wider third world um, predicament. If we look more recently in a paper I've done for the UNESCO General History of Africa, the way in which African and Caribbean ties within the third world were nurtured by Pan-Africanism and vice versa, these make the point that I'm getting at. Now, it is true that in today's world, third worldism and Pan-Africanism are facing many frustrations. And that at the subjective level, it has become somewhat more difficult in the 1990s to organize these notions than they were in the 1960s and 1970s. And yet, objectively, the conditions which produce third world and Pan-African sentiments still remain unabated. We do know, of course, that with the removal of the East-West conflict, it means, on the one hand, that the North-South thing may seemingly be more marginalized, but it, in fact, becomes more important because it still remains the most significant and the only remaining global challenge today at a real global level. It is also true that with the removal of the East-West confrontational dimension, um, the uh, sensitivity, if there was one, to economic aid and development has appropriately declined and resources being shifted into Eastern Europe. It is also true that even within the third world framework, what was once a high degree of collusion of interests up to the late 1970s, some people argue, has now developed into some collision of interests in different parts of the third world. Having said that, however, it is also objectively true that the need for a third world dynamic remains even more profound, the more so because the east-west dimension has declined, the more so in the face of a resurgent arrogant Western capital imperialism, the more so third worldism is needed. Now, what of Pan-Africanism? Interestingly enough, one of the main bonds which cemented a wider African world settlement, apartheid, is now being eroded. So from that point of view, the continued erosion of apartheid has weakened some of the pragmatic links for African world interest world. And on the other hand, the removal of apartheid, fortunately, can promote a greater sense of continental African Pan-Africanism with the removal of a destabilizing white racist regime, which was a great threat to any attempt at regional cooperation in Africa. Now, having said that, however, there is at least one, if not two, levels at which the Pan-African notions become even more important in the 1990s. One has to do 
with the resurgence of what I like to call primitive racism. With all the formal attempts to remove racism in certain racist environments, the reality of racism, not least anti-black, remains a reality. We saw it in the Rodney King case, a reminder. A David Duke who decides, who dares to aspire to the American presidency is an example. Of you go to France and you have right-wing political movements organized explicitly on racism. What is worse? is that with the decline, so to speak, of Africa in the world system. This has, as many people argued, helped further to promote images of racial incompetence, not aided by the AIDS epidemic, not aided by economic underdevelopment, not aided by some of the difficulties of a transition to democratic systems. Then there's a the question of migration, where the racist factor always works itself out. And whether in case of the Haitian, refugees here, or refugees from Africa to Europe, or the increasing presence of African European populations on which much has been written, and even a united Europe is taking steps now to limit the movement of non-Europeans across the particular borders, defying the idea of a united Europe in that particular regard. So therefore, there is all the more reason why, in this so-called New World Order, the question of racial stratification and sensitivities has to remain high on the Pan-African agenda. I make two concluding thoughts in terms of thinking. Difficult as it may be to organize relationships across national boundaries on the Third World or Pan-African framework, difficult as it is, isn't there perhaps another level in which we might still use these frameworks. Let me call it the parallel level. Is there anything happening in Africa today that we might learn from, directly positively or negative, how to do and how not to do things? Is there anything in the Caribbean that Africans can learn from, how to try or how not to try to do things? I have no time to run through a whole agenda, but I think this type of framework is very important, both in terms of economic and political understanding. Many African countries are now moving towards freeing up authoritarian systems. Let us remember that the search for African democracy is nothing new at all. It came out of the anti-colonial movement. Some of it was aborted and frustrated, partly by the delinquency of leaders, quite often with the complicity of Western world allies and Eastern world allies in the context of the Cold War struggle. One can argue that the resurgence of democratic trends in Africa is an extension of the anti-colonial struggle of the 1940s and 50s. But what is the relationship between democracy and electoralism? Between, as Hilburn said, representative as opposed to participatory democracy. What are the prospects for building truly democratic systems in a situation of international global inequities? What are the difficulties of building truly participatory systems when given the increasing constraints of third world environments in the international economic system, the government sooner or later have to become more repressive against the legitimate interests of the people. These are some questions, therefore, we have to ask. What prospects are there for mobilizing different groups? What about the mobilization of women in both areas? African women are now very much on the march, as are women in the Caribbean. How important can this be? in extending notions of participatory um, democracy. What about alternative economic frameworks? Where the African countries have brought forth the African alternative framework, which has had to modify some thinking of the World Bank, might Caribbean economic planners learn something from that particular African experience? Where Africans have developed what they call an African leadership forum, in which African leaders are meeting not to represent their countries, where you always have to bargain, but independently of that and beyond that, trying to pool the leadership resources and skills and interests beyond particular political interests. Can we learn something from that? Finally, if at this parallel comparative level, we might perhaps begin to explore what we might learn or might not learn from each other. There is one global challenge which still remains, and I think captures very well, the interrelationship of third worldism and pan-Africanism. This is the concept of global apartheid. 
Back in the 1970s or early 80s, a Canadian threw up this idea. The division of the world, he pointed out, parallels so much the divisions in apartheid society. The difference between the rich and the poor, the unfortunate coincidence along lines of color and nationality. This whole principle of global apartheid, which is the continuing reality in today's world, is what I think that notions of federalism and pan-Africanism can still be called on to challenge. Thank <laughs> you.